Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B. And we're going to now finish up with our work for Virginia Woolf. You ought to have your hymnal open and your annotations out now to page 1202. And we're going to spend some time now with the famous essay, Shakespeare's Sister. Now this becomes a really important essay in the history of feminist thought. Let's go ahead and use that term again and define it. Feminism. The study or the discipline where we consider the role of women in society. We are going to focus specifically on the role of women in society. And there's a lot of different texts that will in many ways kickstart this movement. None are more important than Virginia Woolf's little essay, Shakespeare's Sister. Now a couple of notes before you uh, listen to this text. One, Virginia Woolf is herself a writer, a woman, female writer, living in a man's world where she has to come to terms with the challenges of the Aristotelian model of view of women. What do I mean by Aristotelian? All are related to Aristotle. Aristotle called this the idea behind this was the great chain of B. And the way he played this game, you've seen this before, I think, is with this pyramid thing, where at the top he put the gods, then he had men, then he had women and slaves and all that other stuff, right? Now, the way this works is value equals power going up. So the higher you are on this pyramid the more value, the more power. Now, the thing we got to say about this that's so crucial for Aristotle from the great Greek period is that he saw this as natural. This is huge. In the same way that Ruthie's tree is not a Christmas tree and no amount of yelling at it is going to change that. And in fact, if you try to yell at it and say, become a Christmas tree, become an evergreen tree, you would say about that, what is wrong with you? Because that is not natural to Ruthie's tree. That type of tree looks like that. In the same way, remember Aristotle is first and foremost a biologist. When you go into biology with Ms. Barnes and you memorize all those different classifications, Aristotle is the one who invents all of that. And about biology, he says, this is totally natural. Therefore, to think that you could ever do that and make men and women equal, he would call that's right. He would call it a natural. Notice the first word that I wrote on my board, though. See, watch how theology and religion will validate the patriarchy. The gods sit up top. Who made this? Who, who made Ruthie's tree, if you're Aristotle? Gods did. Therefore, this relationship between men dominating and controlling women is, for Aristotle, totally natural. Now, with Aristotle, we're talking 300 years before Christ's birth. In Virginia Woolf, we're talking 1900. So for a long time, this view of women has been in place. But here's the problem. Virginia Woolf wants to change that. She wants to change this view. She wants to argue that women should be considered as equal with men. The way she does it in Shakespeare's Sister is a fascinating way. It's a very brief essay, but let's, t let's take a few notes real quickly and then we'll listen to it. It's a fascinating read. She asks a simple question. All of those amazing plays, Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, Hamlet, Macbeth, all those other plays that we've studied and looked at, they were all constructed by a guy, namely Shakespeare. What if Shakespeare had a sister? I don't know, let's just call her Judith. Yeah, let's call her Judith. That's just what we'll call her. We'll name her Judith, and we'll ask a very simple question. Judith, just like her brother, William, is brilliant. She's brilliant. She has an amazing mind. She can write every bit as well as her brother. Are you ready for this? Maybe even better than her brother. Then Wolf asks a very interesting question. Would Judith have ever been able to have the chance to write those plays? Would her family have allowed it? Would her culture have allowed it? Now remember, look at your dates, 
really quickly, right? If you're talking about the dates here of Virginia Woolf, and you can go back in your, in your textbook um, to make sure that you got your dates written down, and it's important that you do this because uh, you want to be sure that you get all of this um, properly ordered. Right there it is on 1188. 1882 to 1940, right? So let's just call it 1900 that she's writing, okay? 1900, uh, uh, almost 100 years before you're born. Did I say that right? Roughly, right? Shakespeare writes Hamlet and performs it in what year? Does anyone remember what year we gave it? 1600. That should get you some plus points on the test sheet, by the way. Remind me at the end of the hour, right? 1600, right. So we're talking about 300, 300 years later. Virginia Woolf says about Shakespeare's sister, it had never happened then. She asks, would it happen now? Are you ready for this? She will end her essay by suggesting Judith would go mad in a society that would not allow her creative genius to be produced. And she would ultimately kill herself. It would drive her, it would drive her nuts. Because she's so creative and given no chance to produce, ultimately it would drive her crazy and she ultimately would take her life. What's darkly ironic? Write it in your notes. What's darkly ironic about that fact? Well, look on 1189. What's the last topic? On 1189, what's the last topic? Reading it with me on 1189, I hope you are. Depression and tragedy. Throughout her life, Wolf suffered episodes of severe depression brought on by poor health. She had frequent periods when she was unable to focus enough to read or write. The turmoil of World War II worsened her depression in 1941. She put rocks in her pockets and walked out into the river house near the Wolf's house in Sussex. Wow. That fact makes reading this essay, Shakespeare's Sister, that much more profound. And today, as we read great women authors, we think of Toni Morrison, we think of Alice Walker, we think of some of our greatest living women female writers. All of them, beginning with Audre Lorde and later, will give tribute to this brief essay. Let's read it together now and take down a few notes as we go. Shakespeare's Sister. Shakespeare's Sister by Virginia. Be that as it may, I could not help thinking, as I looked at the works of Shakespeare on the shelf, that the bishop was right at least in this. It would have been impossible, completely and entirely, for any woman to have written the plays of Shakespeare in the age of Shakespeare. Let me imagine, since facts are so hard to come by, what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith, let us say? Shakespeare himself went, very probably, his mother was an heiress, to the grammar school where he may have learned Latin, Ovid, Virgil, and Horace, and the elements of grammar and logic. He was, it is well known, a wild boy who poached rabbits, perhaps shot a deer, and had, rather sooner than he should have done, to marry a woman in the neighborhood who bore him a child rather quicker than was right. That escapade sent him to seek his fortune in London. He had, it seemed, a taste for the theater. He began by holding horses at the stage door. Very soon he got work in the theater, became a successful actor, and lived at the hub of the universe, meeting everybody, knowing everybody, practicing his art on the boards, exercising his wits in the streets, and even getting access to the palace of the queen. Meanwhile, his extraordinarily gifted sister, let us suppose, remained at home. She was as adventurous, as imaginative, as agog to see the world as he was, but she was not sent to school. She had no chance of learning grammar and logic, ah. let alone of reading Horace and Virgil. She picked up a book now and then, one of her brothers, perhaps, and read a few pages. But then her parents came in and told her to mend the stockings or mind the stew and not moon about with books and papers. 
They would have spoken sharply, but kindly, for they were substantial people who knew the conditions of life for a woman and loved their daughter. Indeed, more likely than not, she was the apple of her father's eye. Perhaps she scribbled some pages up in an apple loft on the sly, but was careful to hide them or set fire to them. Soon, however, before she was out of her teens, she was to be betrothed to the son of a neighboring wool stapler. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her, and for that she was severely beaten by her father. Then he ceased to scold her. He begged her instead not to hurt him, not to shame him in this manner of her marriage. He would give her a chain of beads or a fine petticoat, he said, and there were tears in his eyes. How could she disobey him? How could she break his heart? The force of her own gift alone drove her to it. She made up a small parcel of her belongings, let herself down by a rope one summer's night, and took the road to London. She was not 17. The birds that sang in the hedge were not more musical than she was. She had the quickest fancy, a gift like the birds, for the tune of words. Like him, she had a taste for the theater. She stood at the stage door. She wanted to act, she said. Men laughed in her face. The manager, a fat, loose-lipped man, guffawed. He bellowed something about poodles dancing and women acting. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted, you can imagine what. She could get no training in her craft. Could she even seek her dinner in a tavern or roam the streets at midnight? Yet her genius was for fiction and lusted to feed abundantly upon the lives of men and women and the study of their ways. At last, for she was very young, oddly like Shakespeare, the poet in her face, with the same gray eyes and rounded brows, at last, Nick Green, the actor-manager, took pity on her. She found herself with child by that gentleman, and so, who shall measure the heat and violence of the poet's heart when caught entangled in a woman's body? Killed herself one winter's night, and lies buried at some crossroads, where the omnibuses now stop outside the elephant and castle. That, more or less, is how the story would run, I think, if a woman in Shakespeare's day had had Shakespeare's genius. Now notice this text asks of its readers in 1900, roughly. Have, see, and this is important for you to write this down. She asks a question without actually asking. Have things changed in 300 years? Right? Have we gone any farther? Do men take women seriously? Jot down in 3B, what are your thoughts about this one? Do you feel like things have changed? She is, yes. You know, that would have been last year. Yeah, 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 it's a change. Right, you got it. This is the question then. Have things improved? Do they improve without the voice of a Virginia Woolf? Who will challenge, see my whiteboard again in the drawing, the status quo. Challenge the view that men are not dominant above women and that women should have all of the same opportunities as men. Question, do you think that ever happens in a culture? Is it possible that guys and girls can think of each other as equals and not as one superior to the other? Do you think it's possible? Can it happen? Maybe the easier question to ask is, what keeps it from happening, do you think? Is it the way we're raised? Is it the culture that we live in? Some will argue it's the values of the culture, maybe sometimes the religion of the culture, depending on what culture we're talking about, right? The obvious question is, what about going forward? I had a male student who said out loud in class, 
men will always be superior to women. A few years later, I happened to run across him, and by that point he was married and had a daughter for his firstborn child. And he was ready to send her off to school. She was bright, very bright, much like Judith in this essay. She was sharp. She would speak her mind. She would say what she thought. His observation was, I see things differently, now it's my daughter. I want my daughter to have every opportunity any guy could have. What changed in his worldview? How did it change him to have a daughter himself? See how that works? Now all of a sudden the cultural mores for him, he wanted to change the view. But here's the deal, he said, I've changed my view about men and women. I want to see my daughter as having equal opportunity. But she lives in a world where often she's not taken seriously because she is a woman. Hmm. Do you think things will ever change? Jot down in 3B as we finish this part of our conversation. Jot down in 3B. Do you think, do you think things ever change in this regards? Will your granddaughters have more chance to be considered equals?